That shift is the difference really between heaven and hell, between struggle um, or freedom. And it happens when we allow ourselves to embrace what is arising in the moment instead of living in the shadow of the more, better, different. Just be here now. Just be here now. Welcome to the Be Here Now guest podcast. This series features a collection of teachings and conversations centered around mindfulness, spiritual growth, and living a life in balance. Each week, our diverse network of guest teachers and hosts offer up wisdom and practices from a different spiritual path and perspective. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit BeHereNowNetwork.com slash donate. <clears throat> Sounds good so far. So if you hear the swallows, just ignore them, like consider it like the raindrops. And if you can't hear my voice, just please wave your arms, gesticulate wildly, um, and we'll fix it. I think I learned this from Jack, getting these papers all over around me. Um, <laughs> I don't want to sound like Jack, but here I've got the papers all over, so I guess we can't avoid having um, some influence of the people we admire. So uh, tonight I want to talk with you about working with strong emotions and give you a way of work. I mean, I would be very honest with you right at the start. There's no complete remedy. This is actually a direct quote from the Zen master Suzuki Roshi, um, who said that there's really no complete remedy, but there are ways that we can work skillfully with our strong emotions. And I want to begin this talk by sharing my own strong emotion that I have really been working with in this retreat, uh, which is grief because my mom died two weeks ago. And that's very recent and still very fresh. Uh, And I don't know what it will be like, you know, two months from now or two years from now, but right now it's very fresh and very alive. And sometimes I have been sitting up here and I just start to cry. And I think, well, if they see me crying, they'll know I'm having an emotion. And I'm still sitting here, and we're all surviving, and so that's okay. Uh, But my mom started her dying about two and a half weeks ago, and thank goodness she was only bedridden for about five days. And my mother was old, and I mean, I'm old, and we, you know, she had a really long and lovely life, and so there's nothing tragic about it except that Death exists, and our loved ones have to die, and our parents have to die. There's nothing tragic about it. And yet, and yet, that's my mommy. That's my mom. And um, so the week of deep mourning that we observe in the Jewish tradition, of course, is past. And then there's another month where traditionally people wear a black ribbon that is torn And it's torn to symbolize that part of our heart has been torn away with the loss of our loved one. And, But I'm not doing that. Instead, I'm here doing Buddhist practices with you. And many of you already know, but I would like to also report from here that these practices are indeed uh, a great refuge and that The Buddha, the example of somebody who persevered and 
woke up and basically, in a sense, um, gave us the gift of trust in our own awareness and the Dharma, this process uh, that we are in of becoming more conscious and growing in love and insight and understanding. And the Sangha, the being with each other, have been exactly what the texts say they are, a safe and reliable refuge. So that's important because when we're in the crunch, we want a safe and reliable refuge, and we have one. And so this is a sacred time of mourning, for mourning the very alive and, and loving relationship that I had with my mother, especially at the end of her life, toward the last few years when I was near her more, um, living in Los Angeles where she wound up. And I just want to share this haiku sums up the way my mom felt about dying. I thought to live two centuries or three. Yet here comes death to me, a child of 88. And while my mom was doing her dying, it was really interesting to see that some of us were much more able to be with her in that process, to sit with her than others. And uh, and I mean sit with her without fear or restlessness, without sort of compulsively busying yourself or having to leave the room a lot or go to Starbucks and get a coffee or, you know, these kinds of things that we do. And it was interesting to me that the two people who were most able to do that were the people who have a spiritual practice to help. And all Buddhist practices are about getting really intimately acquainted, um, familiarizing and um, stabilizing our ability to tolerate the raw, intimate experience of our life, the intensity of all experience, being born and dying. And what is the one thing we can say about all relationships? Anybody know? Yes, they end. And so do we. That's the stunning part. Look at us, all of us here together. So do we. And uh, we need practices to help us stay with this and to connect with our humanity. And the practices that we are offering to you, they're all what the Buddha called upaya or skillful means, ways to be able to do this. And they're, they're not ends in themselves and they're not things that you have to get necessarily confused about or your knickers in a twist because this one doesn't work for you that we gave you instructions about. It's okay. Uh, We're offering you various ways of being with and staying with experience so that we can open to really what it is, open our minds and hearts to the way things are. And can you, am I talking too fast, Elizabeth? Can you? Okay. The work we do here in the retreat is to clarify, strengthen, and release the self, ourselves, from suffering, uh, to free the heart from our demons and whatever holds us back from just full-on living and loving. We want to use the practices that work for us and what's the definition of working for us? It really means that help us stay present that help us connect to our experience of the moment. It's pretty simple. Um, So we want to use the practices to grow our capacity to be more and more intimately connected with the 10,000 joys and the 10,000 sorrows that come to us. And one of the things that definitely hinders, I mean, Grove talked about all the things that hinder our ability to be present, but the one that I'm focusing on tonight is our fear, our um, 
inability to tolerate the rawness of strong emotion. Um, So I want to give you a practical way of working with the emotions and just talk for a moment about thought because Grove talked a bit about thought in the instructions this morning and it's really interesting and some of you I'm sure have already seen quite clearly how thought and emotion are connected and uh, what fuels and informs most of our thinking, probably all our discursive, not so clear thinking, is the emotions. Um, Gil Fransdale calls the emotions a factory for producing thoughts. And I think that thoughts also produce emotions. I mean, I know that I have certain thoughts that just, you know, they definitely produce um, an emotional reaction. And just like emotions, our thoughts are, uh, there's not, there's nothing wrong with our thinking. The brain secretes thoughts the way the mouth secretes saliva. It's a perfectly natural process. We're not here to try and stop that process, actually. Um, and being able to accept that we're not here to try to stop that process or to, um, uh, say that, you know, there's something wrong with it. Uh, this is actually freeing for us. How do we actually begin to experience the ephemeral, impersonal nature of thought and feeling? When we're caught in the thick of intense thought storms or feeling storms, um, the Dharma can seem a million miles away can't it? Just like, what are they talking about? You know, I mean, I'd like to believe them. They seem like nice people, but um, <laughs> this does not connect to what I'm experiencing. So uh, what I'd like to do is show you how your particular, unique, even your sticky, stuck, personal, uh, emotional life can connect you to a vast field of awareness, the universal life of all worlds, where, in fact, um, the more usual preoccupations of our thoughts and feelings can either fall away or seem quite manageable and um, small that we can touch to them with mindfulness and metta. So the, the practice that I want to teach you is called, it's got an acronym called RAIN, quite appropriate for tonight. And RAIN means recognize, accept or allow, investigate, and non-identify these ways of approaching emotion. And there are really four practices or tools that we can use in the crunch. And usually in those crunch moments, we will revert to some old strategy that is familiar to us, but uh, it probably worked really well when we were five years old or nine years old, maybe even 14. But now um, it's outdated. And So this is an update, a Dharma update. And um, these four practices can be used sequentially as steps to help deal with the difficult emotions. Um, But they're also a living spiral of awakening and where you can cycle from one step back to the other. And each time around, you have actually developed more mindfulness and and metta. Um, And... Obvious, well, maybe it's not so obvious. We've been beginning to talk about being mindful of and noticing and bringing attention to positive emotions as well as difficult ones. And these practices can be just as well used to recognize and allow and investigate and learn how not to identify with experiences of joy and happiness and bliss 
usually the positive emotions aren't the ones that get us the most um, riled up. I say usually because sometimes people have um, a strategy or a defense of always imagining the worst so that they won't be disappointed um, if what they want doesn't happen. And, and actually, for people who have this particular strategy, a lot of positive emotion can feel like, you know, just too much rich dessert. But that's not the problem for most of us. And we're going to focus more on the difficult feelings. But I'm just wanting you to know that uh, it applies just as well for not getting caught maybe in states of bliss. Although I know that's not usually the problem you're having. So to first recognize this is where our mindfulness is essential. How to recognize what's here. It seems very obvious. And most of us learned in nursery school, you know, the smiley face, happy, the sad face, sad. Um, that was kind of our training in emotional intelligence. Um, <laughs> but sometimes it's not so easy because feelings can be hidden by repetitive thought loops um, that are fueled by emotions that we might think unconsciously are too painful to feel. Um, obsessive planning, for example, can mask a lot of anxiety or fear. And the mind tries to protect us from it feeling that fear or anxiety by generating all these you know, experiences of planning, planning, planning. In fact, I found it's way less painful to drop down into the actual emotion, to recognize it and feel it, than to get into the more secondary or indirect ones. Um, an example that I had today was um, I was kind of busy in the retreat and I started having a lot of thoughts about my mother's death and if only I had told her this thing and why didn't I tell her that thing? And well, the reality is she didn't want to really talk about dying. So I was taking my cues from her. But the mind was generating these kind of regret feelings. And, and then, and it was painful. And then my mind started thinking about my father's death 10 years ago. And you could have told him this before he died and that. And I began to feel, um, well, like a hindrance attack, but it was painful. And I felt awful. And I stopped and took a breath and was able to recognize, oh, this is grief. This is a manifestation of grief. But because I'm busy and I'm not really attending to my feelings, it's coming out in these reproaches, these um, thoughts that are quite convincing. I mean, I could believe them, and they're so painful to believe. But with the recognition of the emotion and going upstairs to my room and sitting down quietly, I could really drop into the feeling, which was just sadness and just some tears that needed to be shed. And that way, that kind of sadness is cleansing. After just crying, I actually felt lighter and, I don't know, and got tea and got back to work quite happily. You know, it, so the indirect expressions of emotion, um, it's hard to see them sometimes. They come out sideways or crookedly or indirectly. And this is why it's important to be mindful um, of the content of our thoughts, too, and not just the um, kind of thought that it might be in terms of, you know, an image or self-talk uh, or a feeling in the body, but we'll get to that. Um, if a specific emotion cannot be known, we can always note the feeling tone of it, uh, 
whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. And that's important to do too. Seeing the emotion doesn't change anything necessarily in terms of making it go away, but it does, it's the absolutely necessary first step to be able to say, oh, ache in the chest, pain, pain, tightening, tightening, tight chest, tears, tears, and recognizing, oh, this is sorrow, this is heartbreak. Very basic, very simple, but not so easy all the time. And just as we practice this internal mindfulness of our own emotions and mind states, we, the Buddha also want us to practice external mindfulness. It's less important in the retreat where we're being silent, but when we're in relationship and talking, it's important to be sensitive and attuned to the emotions that we might be perceiving um, in others, especially in response to us. So that first flash of seeing, that is mindfulness, that deep, direct knowing of the present moment of experience, um, This, in the seeing, there's just seeing, utterly pure in that first moment of what's seen and known. There's really no problem. It's just that instantly the mind jumps in and it finds it pleasant or unpleasant or neither, and then it likes it or dislikes it or is indifferent, and then it constructs endlessly creative, imaginative associations. These are There's a great Pali word, papancha, for this activity of branching, proliferating thought that happens when we see something and come in contact. Um, I have a cartoon about perception. Um, I outlined it so you can see. It's actually um, two snails talking to each other. And one snail is saying to the other about this up here in the corner, I don't care if it's a tape dispenser. I love her. So that initial moment of perception has been long gone, superseded and replaced with an emotion. And um, we all, I think, well, I'll speak for myself, having loved tape dispensers in my life. (laughs) And, you know, quite a few of them. I mean, they had the contours of a... Anyway, uh, so (laughs) it's important, important to be... Uh, to recognize what's there. The second step is uh, acceptance or allowing. When we see what's there, we need to bring some compassion and some willingness to just allow it to be there. Why? Because it's here. That's the only reason. There's no moral reason. Something has appeared in our consciousness. Something has appeared in our heart, in our experience. It's here. It's what's happening. So since we've expressed our commitment to be with what's happening and to know what's happening and to um, appreciate that it's true by coming here to practice the Dharma, um, we try to allow it to be here. The Buddha really wanted us to feel what's to be felt in experience, not to try to suppress or deny or disavow or, you know, get rid of it. For 25 years, I had this quote on the wall of my therapy office. By being in alert attention... By observing oneself with the intention to understand rather than to judge. That's the 
by observing ourselves with the intention to understand rather than to be critical, in full acceptance of whatever may emerge simply because it's there, we allow the deep to come to the surface and enrich our life and consciousness. This is the great work of awareness. Allowing it to simply be so in this great open awareness of heart and mind, in our willingness to sit up straight in the midst of experience that we're cultivating here. How do we do this? Somebody was talking today about um, just how do you deal with the flood of emotion, that kind of tsunami feeling of being completely swept away. Um, And it's so much harder not to get swept away, particularly with content that grabs us. Like, I was very, I am very vulnerable right now to accusations that maybe I wasn't all I could have been with my mom because she's gone. I can't make it right with her anymore. So there's that vulnerability to getting caught in the content. And it's way harder to stay clear than it is with the breath or sensations in the body, um, the foundations of mindfulness that we've been working with in the retreat. Um, So here's a quote in response to that question from the Buddha. He was asked a similar question. How, dear sir, did you cross the flood? By, this is the Buddha's answer, by not halting, friend, and by not straining, I crossed the flood. But how is it, dear sir, that by not halting and by not straining, you crossed the flood? See, I love that because, you know, yeah, really, but how did you do that? And the Buddha goes on. When I came to a standstill, friend, then I sank. And when I struggled, I got swept away. It's in this way, friend, that by not halting and by not straining, I crossed the flood. So what does that mean for us? Uh, Halting in the midst of thoughts or emotions. I I think I understand that as like our mindfulness coming to a standstill and uh, just uh, getting overwhelmed and flooded by either the content of our thoughts or by the intensity of our feelings. And this will happen. It does. I remember a friend of mine, um, a wonderful therapist, um, he made a tape for his teenage daughter called Music to Wallow By. And it had Pachelbel's Canon on it. It had all these very strains of um, beautiful music to, but that's not what we're doing. That would be coming to a standstill. Um, And while there's a certain pleasure in that, there is. It's not the practice. And it doesn't really serve us when we don't choose I mean, it's fine if you're alone in your room and thinking about your lost boyfriend or girlfriend, you know, but there are times when we don't choose. So how can we um, not halt or when we do halt, which is, this is actually more to the point because we will, when we do halt and we do sink, instead of panicking and starting to flail around, mentally and emotionally, reach for our cell phones or, you know, whatever we do, instead of panicking in the water, if we can include the fact of sinking in our mindfulness. Oh, okay. We halted, sinking, sinking, flooded, flooded, overwhelmed, drowning, drowning. The minute that we include this, you know, we're just opening the arms of our awareness bigger and bigger. And that means there's a part of our psyche, of our being, that is not drowning, is not flooded. It might just be a sliver, but that sliver is enough. 
It's enough to help us cross the flood. And not straining. Um, again, the straining would be um, trying to hurry past the difficult. Um, I like to do that. Just get past it really fast. And, and that's exhausting, actually. It becomes exhausting. So to not halt or not strain, um, to not linger or wallow um, and not hurry and try to leap over things, uh, it means the kindness of a whole different uh, stance. And this stance of non-striving, really, of being with experience that we call allowing. And it's very different from passivity. Passivity would be just, you know, letting ourselves drown um, and trusting that something or someone would rescue us at some point. So we can begin to develop the clarity, calm, and kindness to meet and absorb and contain these floods of joys and sorrows in our life and to transform our suffering into wisdom through the power of awareness and our ability to stay present with experience, to stay present with ourselves, to stay with and to forgive ourselves and include our messing up in the field of awareness. That's where we forget. We're mindful, 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 and then we mess up and then we just pile on ourselves, you know, instead of saying, oh, Messing up, messing up, whatever that means. Um, One teacher said, we are not our fault. Uh, One Rinpoche said, all human suffering is caused by our holding the past against each other. If we consider the past the moment that just went by, we could even say, by holding the past against ourselves, you know, because we slipped into, uh, I don't know, some state we disapprove of in the last moment. And it does require some time, and that's why we're here, the time to be with ourselves and, and, um, and learn to connect with the pure emotion so that it doesn't have to come out in these indirect suffering, more crooked ways, or when it does, as it inevitably will, to be able to drop down underneath that. And if you feel your mind, and probably your teachers have already told you this, but when you are in those looping, looping, looping um, circles of thought, it's usually a signal that there is a feeling that wants to be known and felt underneath. So uh, when we come to the investigation part, we look at that. And I guess the uh, last thing I want to say about acceptance, well, maybe not the last, um, one of the last, is that we learn acceptance through relationship. And we're here to develop that kind of more accepting relationship with ourselves, but we really learn it Um, by being in the accepting presence of another, whether it's our parent originally when we were babies. Um, Babies learn this through being in the mostly loving attention of their parents. And it's always very heartening for me to refer to Ed Tronick's research about when I think of being a loving parent or giving myself loving attention or when you think of it, often um, there's that sense of already having failed maybe. And uh, so what is enough? What is steady and consistent enough? Well, the research shows that 30% attunement is enough. The attunement of being really present, receiving an experience, you know, being there, responding, appropriate 30%. That's enough for children, for babies and children to grow into adults who um, have been loved and feel attuned and um, can make uh, this kind of friendly 
kind relationship with ourselves that we're working on, that we're doing here together. Sometimes acceptance is called a gateless gate because it's invisible. You can't see it, but you can feel it. Uh, It's a liminal space. It's like crossing a threshold. There's a subtle shift. And um, it's subtle, but it's, it's unmistakable. And that shift is the difference, really, between heaven and hell between struggle um, or freedom. And it happens when we allow ourselves to embrace what is arising in the moment instead of living in the shadow of the more, better, different. I want it to be more. I want it to be better. I want it to be different. This is not the way it's supposed to be. Uh, How many people came to the retreat having done a retreat or had a previous experience in a workshop that was very, very pleasant and inspired you to set aside the time and come here. And then you get here and somehow the situation and the experiences do not match the expectations that you had. And it usually doesn't, of course, um, are and there's an automatic experience of physical constriction and disappointment and sometimes anger or resentment or frustration or even fear. Um, resisting causes persisting of the problem that we're resisting. The more we resist it, the more power it gains. It would be great if struggling with experience um, would make it actually go away. But it doesn't. Arguing with reality is depressing. It makes us anxious. And we often self-sabotage out of fear and resistance, rebelling against what is oddly unable to let go. Acceptance allows reality to be as it is. And since it is that way anyway, we might, I mean, we have to make some relationship with it. We just do. And So what kind will we make? And paradoxically, and um, one thing I saw very clearly as a clinician, as a psychotherapist, that accepting, when people could accept the thing that they would come to therapy wanting to change the most, in which which my senses drop into the deep and... I've found kind of in them, mysterious as thing, in but old somehow, letters, if we can positively connote what needs to change, lived through, bring some compassion and become wide to and it, surrounding it like legends. with compassion and understanding, we stop then the I know reality and that there's room in me to move for a second and huge this is a kind and of timeless life. Acceptance. And this huge and timeless life is the one we've entered here together. Very broad, very big acceptance of the many different kinds of emotions that visit our hearts. And maybe appreciation expresses it more clearly. Um, But it's a process, it's an activity on our path. The third is investigate, recognize our Accept and allow, A, investigate and inquire. That's the I in RAIN. When thoughts and feelings are strong, they do have a powerful hold on our mind. So we do use mindfulness to investigate So this means the recognizing, the seeing, the accepting. But it doesn't mean investigating the content of our thoughts, as Grove was saying this morning. Um, It doesn't mean trying to analyze the story. I think I spent the first couple years on my cushion doing self-therapy like that. And that was okay, but maybe you can skip that part. (laughs) And... um, (laughs) It doesn't mean to think about why you're having that thought. It doesn't mean to, this will get to the non-identification, to think, you know, I'm having this absolutely just 
disgusting thought. I must be a disgusting person. Or I'm having quite a brilliant thought. I must be a pretty creative person. Um, It means just turning our attention to our present moment experience, the mental images or sounds of a thought, the feelings in the body and the sensations that are related to the emotion, and investigating what is this? What is this? Well, with the grief example I was using in the mind, it was coming out as regrets and reproaches too, with all the thoughts that accompany that. And, but in the heart, just the ache of brokenheartedness. And this is actually where, the point where we begin to connect our personal, unique, individual experience with more universal experience of just our humanness being alive in this incarnation as a human being. Um, From Achan Sumedho, you can develop your own trust and courage, your own confidence and fearlessness to and learn to investigate experience rather than resist or be frightened by it. And so often we've been conditioned not to do that, not to ask the question, what is this, and look deeply. Um, This is another New Yorker cartoon, and it shows a man standing, actually towering over his cat. And the cat is sitting by the litter box, and he's saying, never, ever think outside the box. (laughs) So here... We want to think outside the box, the box of our personal preoccupations and self-reference, looking at all of experience through the lens of, is this good for me or bad for me? Is this help me or hurt me? It's really like looking at the sky, you know, through a straw. And so... How do we do it? By fully connecting with the particular in the ways that I and all the teachers have been talking about with the particular experience of the moment, there is also a connection with the universal. Achan Sumedho always says, oh, it's like this. In Zen, we say this too. Like this. Sadness is like Heartbreak is like this. Calm is like this. This relative world of self and other, when we fully connect with it, allow it, embrace it, it can transform the suffering, even the salt of tears, even bitterness. It can transform into wisdom. So we want to investigate our thinking, our feeling, our um, illusions. And uh, this is from Gina. Uh, Am I really a little piece of shit around which the entire world revolves? (laughs) Um, We want to investigate this. Is this true? Really? Really? I might feel like, is it really true? Um. (laughs) I know, her her talk was so eloquent and so beautiful and so (laughs) elegant, and she is too. I just had to say that, but um, that she can be earthy too. Um, So we're looking at how the personal story doesn't have to be denied or disavowed. It can help us connect with the universal story. One yogi from um, a past retreat 
this spring was practicing metta for a whole month, and she discovered that she could dissolve all her feelings into metta. And she was overjoyed, and she imagined that metta would fill her heart, and she would never be reactive again. (laughs) It felt so powerful, so real. She was so happy. And then she realized, like, she would be sitting in the dining hall, her heart overflowing with metta, sending it to everybody. And then she'd see somebody take an extra cookie. <laughs> and you know, that's the surreptitiously, you see people, you know, just shove that hard boiled egg into their pocket and, <laughs> um, you know, stick that extra. I think it said take one or start with one. And anyway, and uh, they'd slip it into their pocket and she would be just flooded with judgment and filled with aversion toward this low life who could, you know, try and like get an extra cookie. And because she was practicing it in retreat and investigating this process, uh, she was able to see the dismay and the deludedness of imagining that um, she could stay in any one state forever and actually begin to hold both her aversion and her metta in the same heart. So this is one way that the unique stream of our personal narrative can join the wider river of our humanness, of all human life, the river of my particular suffering of losing my mother joins the ocean of suffering. We all have a mother and a father and children and brothers and sisters and loved ones. What is it? Oh, it's like this. This is what it's like when we lose somebody we love. When we can feel an intense emotion in the body, when we can really ground ourselves, and this is, of course, another way to cross the flood, the most time-honored way that we teach, really, the foundation of mindfulness of grounding ourselves in the felt experience in the body of any given emotion, Um, again, with the intention to understand how it lives and has its being, how it's born and lives and has its being and dies and passes away um, in the body. But it has to be with the intention to care rather than to cure. Because the wish to, when we approach experience with the agenda of wanting to make it go away, it doesn't work. Sorry to tell you, but you know this already. And so when we can really just be in the body, in the experience, um, this is another way. Um, from Achan Sumedho, uh, who's really great on this, be the knower, he says of the object, but we're not using that word, be the knower of experience, not the owner of the experience. And this leads to the non-identification, the end of RAIN. How do we be the knower of an experience without being the owner of the experience? Well, we, the whole talk has been about this, how we shift the awareness, our attention, from being caught, lost, identified, flooded, drowned by the content of our thoughts or emotions to this spacious consciousness that Jack was talking about on the first night of the retreat, the one who knows, the awareness. And this way we begin to develop, we build our strength of awareness by attending to it. And gradually it can become um, strong enough to meet the emotions. Oh, excitement is like, This, this is what excitement is like. Lust is like this. This is what lust is like. 
sadness is like this, fear is like this, anger is like this. We just really um, can embrace, accept, uh, sit with. I guess the for me the best uh, story about non-identification of, with experience came from my first teacher, uh, De San Sanim, a Korean Zen master. And it was a time when I was very heartbroken because I had to get divorced and I was really upset. And San Sanim knew me and my uh, former husband really well and hadn't seen him since our separation and he came from Korea and a few old students got to have lunch with him and we were sitting in the restaurant and I was sitting next to him and he took my hand and I started to cry. Just that gesture of kindness, I just started to cry. And he squeezed my hand and he muttered under his breath, weather all he said and it was such a powerful teaching he was saying these tears it's like rain they'll come and go our emotions are like the weather we don't have to identify with them lust anger joy sorrow peace calm joy gratitude they'll come and go This is uh, the end of a Mary Oliver poem about non-identification. She says, look, I want to love this world as though it's the last chance I'm ever going to have to be alive and know it. Sometimes in late summer, I won't touch anything. Not the flowers, not the blackberries, brimming in the thickets. I won't drink from the pond. I won't name the birds or the trees. I won't whisper my own name. One morning, the fox came down the hill, glittering and confident, and didn't see me. You know, she was so quiet, not touching anything. So quiet. The fox came down the hill, glittering and confident, and didn't see me. And I thought, so this is the world. I'm not in it. It's beautiful. So I want to close with a poem called In the World. In the strange evening half light, we sit In the cloudiness of our questioning, we sit. In our madness and our clarity, we sit. In the midst of too much to do, we sit. In the warm arms of our shared sorrow, we sit. In community and in loneliness, we sit. In sweet exhaustion, we sit. In the blazing energy of being alive, we sit. Here with the raindrops and spring peepers, here with the returned bird songs, Here, with the rippling of spring breezes and fresh green grasses. Here, with the cobwebs and clouds and moon and the country road upon us. Us in the sound and the sound in us. Us in the world and the world in us.
The love of the Dharma has already arisen so deeply in you that it will carry you through all the strong emotions of your life, no matter what comes to you. You can do this. You can handle this, whatever the this is. And with some mindfulness and metta, you can meet it with dignity and courage. When we're not afraid to cross over to the other shore, when we really long to cross over to the other shore, we find what Albert Camus said, in the midst of winter, I found an invincible summer. The steadiness and reliability of our refuge, our own minds and hearts. So let's just sit for a minute. Thank you for your attention.